In this tutorial, we're going to show you an example of creating vectors for this Avalon nameplate using simple rectangles and text. We're then going to take those vectors and walk you through creating some basic toolpaths for them. We're then going to show you how you can preview your toolpaths in a 3D simulation, check everything looks OK, and then we're going to go and show you how to save those toolpaths ready to send to the CNC. So let's start by opening a new copy of the software and we're going to go ahead under the startup task and create a new file. And this will open up the job setup form for us and we are going to start by creating a single solid job. Now that should be default so just make sure that that is selected and then we can go down and select to set the job size parameters. So we're going to change the width to 7.5 we're going to change the height or the Y value to 3 inches we're going to set a thickness of the material itself to quarter of an inch I'm going to make sure that the units that we selected to work in are inches. We're going to have the Z0 position off the top of the block, which is going to be the top of the material surface, and then we can choose our XY datum position. Now this is the reference point from where the toolpaths will, will be created from. And for this, we're going to actually leave this in the center at the moment, as this will aid us in creating some of our vectors and then we can go ahead and change that back to any position that we would prefer when we go ahead and create the toolpaths themselves. So I'm just going to go ahead and press OK and the first thing that we're going to do is create the rectangles which represent the border of our Avalon nameplate. So to do that we just simply come under the drawing options and go to create vectors and you'll find this icon here which says draw rectangle. Click on that and that will then open the draw rectangles form. Now the first option that we are presented with is the anchor point. Now this is the point where the width and height are going to extend from. So at the moment it's in the center of what would be the rectangle. And then we also have an X value and Y value. Now this is going to be the coordinates where the rectangle is going to start. So at the moment it's in X0, Y0. So that means if we take these values, the square or rectangle that we create is going to have the center point at X0, Y0. And then we're going to have the height uh, and width are going to go around that. And that's exactly what we want. We want to place a rectangle which is going to start and be dead centered in the center of our work area. The next options that we are presented with is the corner type. So at the moment we have a very sharp square corner and we do have a representation here. We then can choose a radius external corner or we can choose a radius internal corner. Now we want to have radius external corners so I'm just going to select the center option there and then we can go ahead and just underneath that we can set a radius for the corner. So I'm just going to type in here 0 0.15 for the radius and then we can go and specify the height and width of our rectangle. So I'm going to specify a width of 6.8 inches and a height of 2.4 inches and then all I need to do is just press the create button and that should create that rectangle with the center point at x0, y0 so it's perfectly aligned in the material. So we just created the vector that represents the outer border shape of our nameplate. Now we want to create another vector which represents the inner border vector. So all we need to do is go back into the form and just edit the parameters which we need to. So we're going to keep the anchor point in the center with the values of x0, y0. We're going to keep the radius external corner type. We're just going to change the radius to from 0.15 to 0 0.05 like so. Then we're just going to change the width to 6.5 inches and the height of 2.1 inches and then just going to press create and you'll see that that's now created another rectangle for us. Now we can simply press close on that form as the next lot of vectors that we're going to create are the text for our nameplate. So for that we come to the create vectors section and we look for this icon here and we simply just click on the text tool and that will then bring us into the create text form and then the first thing we're going to do is we're going to type our text into that box so we're going to just type Avalon with a capital A like so and then we can scroll down and you'll see that we get to choose now the font type that we want to use for our text now we get two options we get a true type which are all the fonts that are listed in your Windows system and then we also have some single line fonts which we've put into the software for engraving purposes. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep this at the true type font. I'm just going to go and press the drop down 
like so, and this then lists all the fonts that are available in our system for us. And we can simply scroll through these to find the one that we want, or we can start typing. So I want the Arial font, so I can just start typing A R I A L, and that'll bring us up the font, and then all we need to do is hit enter on the keyboard to accept that font. And for our text, we don't want to have the text in bold or italics, so we're just going to leave those options unchecked. The next lot of options are where we want to align the text. Now, we want to align the text in the center, so I'm just going to make sure that this option is checked. And then we're just going to specify a text height. So I'm just going to text, specify the text height at 1.3 inches, like so. And then the anchor point is going to be x0, y0, as we want this to be positioned in the center of our material. So click apply, and you'll notice that that has appeared above the x0, y0. Now that is correct, as it's aligned the bottom of the text with x0, y0, and it's also put the text alignment in center. Now what we wanted is for the text to be centered in the material block or inside these rectangles. Now because we know that the rectangles are aligned to the material block, because that's the way we created them, we can simply use this option here underneath the transform objects tool to align the selected objects. Now we know that the text is currently selected as it's a solid pink in color and with that selected we can go into the align selected objects tool and what we're going to do is we're going to use this option here which is going to align the selected object to the material and with the arrows you can see that it's representing we're going to align it vertically and horizontally at the same time. So when we click that it should be in the dead center like so. So once we've done that we can simply press close on the alignment tools form and this is all the vectors that we need to create for our Avalon nameplate. So we can go over and start creating the toolpaths. How we do this is we simply go to this arrow at the top and you'll see that when we hover over it it says switch to toolpath commands and what this will do is this will hide the drawing tab and it will then open and pin out the toolpath tab. Now we can go back to the tool drawing tab anytime if temporarily by just hovering the mouse over the drawing tab here or we just press this arrow here to go back over to the design commands like so. Now before creating any toolpaths we must always check the material setup. Now how we do that is we simply press this set button here like so and what we can do here is we just check over our parameters which we specified to begin with and if we need to change anything this is the time to change them as these are the parameters which we're going to use to create the toolpaths with. So we're just going to check that the thickness of the material that is a quarter of an inch as we did specify now at the moment you can see the XY datum position is in the center. Now that was handy for us when we were drawing the vectors but we may not wish to have that as a starting point for our toolpaths. Now I'm just going to change this to the bottom left as that normally helps with aligning your toolpaths with the material block on the CNC machine. Next is the Z0 position. Now this is the position where we measure the tool off from whether that be the material surface or the machine bed and it also enables us to create the tool pass for you accordingly. We're going to measure from the material surface, we're just going to make sure that this option is checked. Then we can move on to the rapid Z gaps above material. Now these are the gaps above the material where the tool is allowed to retract to and then move around the material. And basically the measurement that we put in here needs to be high enough to avoid any clamps we may have holding down the material for us. So just make sure that those are relevant to our setup. And then we have the home start position. So this is going to be where the tool is actually going to start the toolpath from. At the moment it's set to x0, y0 and the z gap above the material is how high the tool will sit above the material before starting any toolpath. So at the moment it's at 0.8 of an inch and that is fine. So once we've done this we can simply press OK and then we can start creating our toolpaths. Now the first toolpath that we are going to create is a toolpath where we're going to machine away the material between the inner border vector and the text. So we're leaving the text standing pronounced. So how we do that is we first of all select all the vectors that are involved in that toolpath. So at the moment you can see Avalon is currently selected as it's a solid pink. And if we hold the shift key down on the keyboard 
we can then select other vectors as well. So then I can go ahead and hover my mouse over this inner border vector and I can select that as well. Now because the border is a singular vector that now highlights in a dashed pink color whereas Avalon is actually a collection of different vectors which is why it's a solid pink. So with those selected we can go over to the toolpath operations and then we can find the suitable toolpath. Now for this we would need to have a pocket toolpath which is this icon here and then we can simply click that and that will then open up the pocket toolpath form. Now at the moment you can see that show advanced toolpath options is checked. Now for this we just need the simple toolpath option so I'm just going to uncheck this like so. If we ever wanted those options back, we can just simply press the checkbox and it will then reveal those extra options, like so. So the first parameters that we need to set are the start depths and the cut depths of this toolpath. So we're going to start the cut depth from 0, 0, which is going to be the top of the material. And then we're going to specify the cut depth to be 0 0.1, so a tenth of an inch down into the material. Now the next option is to select the tool we wish to use for the pocket toolpath. So if we press this select button, this will open up the tool database, where we have pre-created a load of default tools. Now before cutting any toolpaths, we would need to edit the parameters which have been entered for the tool you would plan to use. The tool database also gives us the option to edit and add new tools and variations of tools for cutting different materials. And I will add the tool database guide as a related video for you in the related video section of the tutorial browser. Now let's imagine that we want to use an 8 inch end mill. So we go to the end mill section, we'll select the 8 inch end mill like so. We'd have obviously already created our own parameters for this tool. But let's imagine that we want to just edit the parameters of this tool just for this toolpath and toolpath only. How we would do that is we would select the tool, press OK, and we'd use the edit button to the side of the select button, and this would bring up the parameters for that specific tool. And then we could go ahead and edit them, and they will be the tool parameters which would be used when the toolpath is saved. So we could come and change the step over to 20% of the tool. Now we'd maybe change it down because we're using really tough material so I may just change that to 20% then I may want to change the spindle speed down to around 6000 rpm a feed rate of 50 inches per minute and a plunge rate of 10 inches per minute once specified we can press OK and that will then store those parameters and we can always check the parameters that are used for a toolpath by pressing the edit button again and you'll see if they're still relevant those are the, those are the parameters that are going to be used for creating the toolpath so just press OK. Next, we get to choose the strategy for cutting out the toolpath. So we can choose either the offset or rastering strategy. Now, offset follows the shape of the vectors, as denoted by the image here. Or we can choose the rastering strategy, where the tool will go back and forth at the angle that we specify in this box here. And then we also have the option to go around all the vectors with a profile pass afterwards as well. So for this, I'm just going to choose the offset strategy. And with either of these strategies, we get to choose the cut direction, whether that be climb or conventional style cutting. I'm just going to leave this uh, with the default of climb. And then we can move down to the next option, which is, gives us the option to ramp any of the plunge moves. Now what this means is rather than plunging the tool directly into the material to the cut depth that we specify, we actually are going to slowly move the tool diagonally down in a zigzag fashion to that cut depth. Now what that does is that alleviates all the pressure on the downward facing teeth of the tool and it also brings in some of the t side cutting teeth as it moves down to that specified cut depth. So I'm just going to check this option on and I'm going to specify the ramp distance to be half an inch in total like so and then we just have to name our toolpath. Now it's always good to name the toolpath something relevant and also sometimes it's always good to include maybe the tool name just to remind us what tool we are using. But it all depends, it's all down to you to decide what naming convention suits your toolpathing best. So I'm just going to name this pocket 0125 EM for end mill and I'm just going to press calculate like so. And what this will do is this will bring us into the preview toolpath form and automatically change into the 3D view, as you can see. 
Now over on the right hand side is all of our preview toolpaths options and just underneath that is our toolpath list and you can see the toolpath that we just created is listed here and it's also checked as well. Now when it's checked it means that it's going to draw the toolpaths path on our 3D view so you can see that when I check that back on you can see our toolpath is listed here. Now I'll just go through with what each of these actually mean. Now the red lines are all the rapid movements between plunges then we have the light blue which is our ramping into the cut then we have the green lines which represent the tool actually moving in and out of the material between rapid moves and then we have the dark blue lines which represent the actual tool path's path itself and if I just reset the view so by pressing the Z icon there you can even change the actual colour of the material that we're using so you've got a whole list here and you've got different woods that we could use uh, we've got different metals that we could use, we've got different stone we can use but for this I'm just going to use the steel bright and then you can also give the cutout areas and also colour as well so if you have a global fill colour like as is selected at the moment it means any of the toolpaths are all going to be defined as this colour if we have it as material colour it will just stay the same as whatever selection it is here or we can have an individual toolpath colour. Now this is good if we're going to be starting to create uh, different preview images and I'll just get to that in a moment. So I'll just change this to global fill colour like so. I'm just going to choose a dark green and then with the toolpath selected we can preview the selected toolpath. Now we've got animate preview on at the moment and draw tool and this will basically show you the workings of the tool as if it was going to be cut on a CNC. So if I just preview you'll see the tool and it will be whizzing around as it's cutting away this virtual material. And we can see now in the virtual 3D simulation what the object would actually look like if we were going to cut this on a CNC machine. And what we're looking for here is anything that doesn't look as you expected it to be. If it doesn't look right here, it would definitely not look right when cut on the machine. So only save our toolpaths once we have fully checked over the material setup, speeds and feeds of all the tools and toolpaths, and we've investigated the toolpath previews. So once we've done that, we can simply close the preview toolpath form, and then we can start creating the next toolpath. So let's go back into the 2D view. So we just click this tab here, like so and we can deselect those select, selected vectors at the moment by clicking anywhere other than the vectors like so and then what we're going to do is we're going to create the cutout pass for our nameplate so for that we're going to select the outermost uh, border vector like so and then we're going to go into the toolpath operations and we're going to come to the profile toolpath like so and click that and that will then open up that form for us now again we're going to make sure that the show advanced toolpath options is deselected and we're going to start by selecting the cutting depths. So we're going to start again from the top of the material and we're going to cut down to the full depth of the material. Now there is a shortcut if we can't remember off the top of our heads what that is. We can just type in the letter Z and then press the equals key on the keyboard and that will then bring up the Z value that we've created. Next we can then go ahead and choose our tool, so I'm just going to go into the tool database like so and select again the 8th inch end mill and this time I'm just going to keep the parameters as they are and then we can choose where we actually want to machine on our vectors so we can choose either outside, inside or on, now because I want to cut out the part I'm going to uh, cut on the outside of the vectors and I'm going to keep the direction as climb Again, I'm going to use the ramp plunge moves and I'm going to choose half inch distance again. And then we can add tabs to toolpaths. Now what these are, are bits of material left over by the toolpath itself which holds the finished product in place. Now this basically just stops the part moving while we're cutting it out. And we only really need to use these if we don't have any other hold down method like a sticky tape or a vacuum table. So I'm just going to assume that we don't have uh, any other hold down method so I'm going to go ahead and add some tabs and then I'm just going to make the length 
0.15 and the thickness 0.08 of an inch. And then I'm just going to go ahead and give my toolpath a name. So I'm just going to call this profile cut out and just put the dimensions of the tool in there with EM for end mill and press calculate. Now the software has given us an error message. Now it basically says that no tabs have been defined on the selected vectors, which basically means we haven't actually added any tabs manually to the vector itself. So if I press OK, it'll go to the preview toolpath form and with the toolpath selected, we're going to go ahead and preview the selected toolpath and you'll see that there's no tabs or any bits of material that have been left on to hold our part in place, which is quite dangerous as that part may end up spinning off the, the machine. So what we're going to do is we're just going to undo last, which is going to undo that toolpath operation, and we can double click into the toolpath, which then brings us back into that toolpath form, and we're going to go ahead and press this button here to edit tabs, and this will then take us into the toolpath tabs form. Now we can add a constant number of tabs, so if I just want four for instance, I can just press four, then press add tabs like so, but we may not like the position of each of these tabs as some are on the corners like so. So if we wanted to move them, all we would do is wait for the symbol to change with the X in the angle brackets like so, hold the left mouse key down and then just move them to where you would like them. So I'm just going to put them equally about halfway uh, along each of the sides like so. And then just press close and now when I calculate the toolpath those tabs will be visible and you can also see them in the toolpath as well, like so. So let's preview that now. And now you'll see that we have tabs remaining, holding that part in place. Now if you wanted to save uh, a picture or an image of this preview, we can simply do that by going to view and save shaded image. And then you can go ahead and save that. And then you can send that image your client for approval. Now once we've got that approval, and we have examined the toolpath preview and all the toolpaths and their settings and we're ready to actually go ahead and save those toolpaths out to run on the machine. All we need to do is simply close the preview toolpath form and go into the save toolpaths form itself. So click on this icon here and this is the save toolpaths form. And you can simply select any of the toolpaths and those will then be listed as the toolpath to be saved. So you can see I've selected the pocket toolpath at the moment and that's the one that's listed with the name of the tool and tool number here as well. And if I change it to the profile cutout, you see that that's then changed that as well. So let's imagine that we're going to save the pocket toolpath. What we would do then is we would need to select our post processor, the one that's most appropriate for our machine or control software that's going to control the CNC machine. So we click on the drop down and what we need to do is find the one that's most appropriate. So let's say we're running Mac 3, which is a very common control software. I can simply start typing M for Mac 3 to get to the all the post processors that start with M. And then I just need to find the one that's most appropriate for me. So I'm just going to go with the Mac 2, 3 arcs and inches like so and select that one and then all I need to do is save toolpath and I can save that toolpath with any name that I wish press save like so and I can even output direct to machine if I do have that capability now what other capability I do have is I have the out ability to output all visible toolpaths to one file now we can only do this if we don't have an automatic tool changer, if the tool has the same geometry. Now, if we just select that, I can demonstrate this. So if I select the pocket toolpath, you'll see that's now listed. And I can also select the profile cutout path. And because they both share the same tool geometry and tool number, I will be able to save these out together. So they will run one after the other. Now, if I had toolpaths with different tools, I would be able to output them together, but I'd need to make sure I selected a post processor that had ATC in its name, which stands for Automatic Tool Changer. And I also need to make sure that the tool numbers are related to the, the tool number on the CNC itself. Now, once we've finished saving the toolpaths, it would be good to save our work. So I'm just going to go to File and Save. And I'm just going to call this Avalon Nameplate underscore 
getting started and it's going to go ahead and press save like so. And with that concludes this tutorial, so thank you very much for watching.